this video, I'm going to be putting together an awesome $1,500 gaming PC build for 2023 and beyond. I'll be walking you guys through all the parts I picked for this build and why, including some great alternatives, covering off exactly how to build this system step by step, and looking at detailed performance benchmarks later, testing everything from the latest AAA titles to popular esports games alike. Let's do this! <laughs> Now let me begin by walking you guys through all the parts that make this build possible. Starting with the heart of the system really, in the form of the CPU. Now the CPU market is full of loads of great options right now. AMD's Ryzen 5 7600 is an awesome value chip for about $200, as is the Intel Core i5 13400F. The 13400F has the advantage of having a few more cores, giving us a little bit of a multitasking performance upside and still has awesome out of the box clock speeds. The F designation at the end means it has no integrated graphics, saving us money as we don't need them with our 4070 GPU, providing all of the gaming muscle. The 4070 is one of the components I do want to touch on briefly before we start putting the build together. Of all the Nvidia 40 series stack, the 4070 is one of the better options. You get 12 gigs of VRAM, avoiding the 8 gigabyte VRAM limitations at higher resolutions, with solid rasterization performance and of course support for features like DLSS3, which we'll look at in more detail later. Be selective over which 4070 you buy, a card close to MSRP like this one is a better shout and helps to make its case as a good value choice. I'll be installing all of the parts, including of course the CPU I just mentioned, into this, the Gigabyte B760 Gaming X AX. B760 is the motherboard chipset, you want to go for a lower end chipset for a more budget oriented build. There's no need for a Z series overclockable, all singing, all dancing design for a system like this. And you want a board with DDR5, not DDR4 support, much better for future proofing with Wi Fi. The AX on this board means it has got Wi Fi. Taking a look at this board, and I've read some good things about it, and my first impressions are pretty good. It's one of the more simple designs out there, but you still get the DDR5 RAM support, plenty of room for fast PCI Gen 4 drives, and if we take a little bit of a peek at the IO just here, two and a half gig Ethernet, USB C of the five gigabit format, USB 3.2 Type A, so loads of next gen connectivity, and Wi Fi 6. Of course, it isn't as well connected as higher end designs, but it really isn't bad. Now, to install the CPU, you want to take a look at the CPU socket just here, pull up the retention arm, and that's going to reveal the pins of our LGA 1700 socket design. Take the CPU next up and locate the golden triangle in the corner. You'll match this up with the bottom left hand corner of the CPU socket socket in this build that's just down here before returning the cover into place. The black plastic will clip off, but keep this safe as you may need this for RMA in the motherboard or if you sell it, for example. It just protects the pins on the socket and we're good to go. I can use this opportunity to add the memory in. This is the Patriot Extreme 5 Viper memory. This has some really, really fast clock speeds, is available in huge capacity variations, and just in general, it's going to be an awesome fit for a system like this. 32 gigs of RAM is basically the given amount of memory you need nowadays. If your build is sub $1,000, you can get away with 16 gigs but I really wouldn't recommend it. This kit was like $90, really not too expensive for 32 gigs of RAM and just goes to show how fast some of these components have fallen in price recently. It also isn't too tall, so air cooler clearance shouldn't be too bad, but make sure you check if you are using a tower design rather than the liquid cooler for this system. SSD wise, I've picked up the Samsung SSD 980 Pro. Of all the drives on the market, I've seen some phenomenal deals on these drives recently. I saw a two terabyte one on Newegg the other week for 99 US dollars. It's risen in price very slightly since that date, but you get the gist. RAM prices are down, SSD prices are down. Now's a great time. if. You want to know my opinion to build a gaming PC. This one does have a heatsink built in, but you don't need to get one with a heatsink already built in. And a little toolless latch on the motherboard means the whole drive installs very, very simply. Weirdly, on Gigabyte boards, the drives are actually upside down though. So just bear that in mind if you do go for a heatsink one like me, the text might be a bit skew if. 
While I'm here, I'm also gonna go ahead and unbox the cooler. This is the Deepcool LS520. And you might wonder, why have you gone for a liquid cooler in a build where we won't be doing any overclocking? Well, the idea today really was to create a quiet system, one with plenty of upgradability. And if I'm being honest with you, some of the higher end air coolers are so expensive that this unit sets you, what, $80 back? You can get deals and offers and rebates that make it even less. It is a bit of a no brainer really if you want a more premium cooling solution without spending the earth. Now inside the box, you'll find a bracket like this. It's got four screws protruding through. And if we spin the motherboard around, it should just pop in the back, nice and easy. Then you'll see we've now got four posts that poke through the board and will provide the mounting hardware and mechanism to actually secure the cooler in. What we need to do at this stage is open up this included bag of plastic stoppers, which will slot over the top of these posts. This is basically all the prep that needs to be done at this stage, but it's a really, really useful bit of prep to do as doing this later on can be quite cumbersome and difficult. So add all of those in, push the stoppers down, and you should have something that looks a little something like this. And that is the stage of the build then where the case can come into play. This is the Cougar Duoface RGB. Now I first had the pleasure of looking at this chassis over at Computex in Taiwan back at the start of June, and it piqued my interest. In many ways, this is just a fairly generic ATX mid-tower chassis, but it has some really nice usability features features that I rate really quite highly. It's got a triple slot vertical GPU mount. That's great for 40 series cards, for example, and allows you to just set them back from the side panel slightly. Supports full-size motherboards. Got an integrated little GPU support bracket built into this NZXT style cable cover. And the party trick of this case, which is probably the bit you're most interested in, is that the front actually pops off. Okay, James, that's nothing new, but wait for it, can be replaced with an included mesh panel. I've seen it before where you can get various alternative panel designs, but they don't include them. So no one's ever gonna do it, but Cougar have included it. So you can either have a mesh design, can't actually get that off, there we go. Or I'm a bit of a sucker for glass. I'll happily sacrifice a little bit of airflow for something that looks a bit more sleek, but you've got both options. And I commend Cougar for that decision. It's then a simple case. Once the case is laid down flat, that makes this bit a lot easier. Of sliding the board in, you see the rear IO shield poke through, get it all lined up. Oh, wow, we have a problem. I was gonna say it's a simple case of sliding it in and screwing it down, but it isn't. Cougar have missed a couple of the standoffs. I'm not sure why, maybe to accommodate for different configs, but you need to add some more standoffs. So for an ATX board, one here, one here, and one here, just the three down the right-hand side. Not a huge problem, but they definitely could have put those in as standard, in my opinion. The next thing to get on with is this, the radiator. I'm gonna add the fans onto the bottom. So these are gonna provide our exhaust at the top of the case. And in order to do that, I need to actually pop the fans on before putting the radiator into the chassis. As doing the other way around and it gets very tight, very difficult, very complicated. This is just far, far easier. Then it's a case of adding the read. That didn't sound good. It's a case of adding, I think one of my screws has fallen out. Uh, uh, anyway, my radiator is going to go into the top. But before that, I am actually going to pop the water block around the CPU. You get the included thumb screws in the box to actually tighten the block down. Then some screws for the rad to the very, very top panel of the chassis. The graphics card is the next part on my hit list today. And I'm actually quite intrigued to see this Gigabyte Gaming OC design. I haven't done loads and loads with the 4070, but it's a GPU that's definitely fallen more into favor as of late. This particular model's got three fans with the RGB rings behind. You've got that new small 12 pin power connector, nice back plate, and you can see the PCB ends about here. And this is all heatsink extension for extra cooling. One of the best things about this card is just how power efficient the 4070 is. It's one of the best for power consumption of any GPU on the market. And I like the aesthetic of this Gigabyte model. You of course get DLSS3, meaning you can in games like Formula One 2023, for example, use frame generation to get even more frame rate. In titles where frame gen is supported, you will see significant upsides against basically all of the competition and the ray tracing tech on the 4070 is mature than that of AMD's GPUs. You might pay a little bit more for it and you've got to decide whether or not that's something you want to do or not, but we'll be looking at performance in a bit more detail in the benchmarks very shortly. If we spin the chassis around, now we can make a decision here. We can either go for a vertical GPU mount and looking at it, I think we would have the clearance to make it happen, or we can go ahead and pop the GPU on the horizontal mount, which I think also looks good and would allow us to use the included GPU support. I actually don't know which is going to look better and I'm a bit stumped. I think the determining factor is going to be whether or not the PCI riser cable I've got fits with the vertical GPU mount. So let me pop that into the first slot. 
I imagine Cougar probably sell their own version, which I haven't got. So let's see whether or not this is going to be compatible. It should be. Is that going to fit? Oh, it definitely is going to fit. In order to actually install it, I've made my life a bit tricky here. <laughs> Remove this thumb screw here. I was going to say, is it captive? It isn't. It's just fallen off. Then take out the middle and the furthest most PCIe cover. Bit of a tricky one. It's very, very tight. But two screws later and the GPU should then slot in. There we are. Look at that. Just to show you again, GPU slots in to the mount. Isn't particularly heavy, so should hold absolutely fine of its own accord. And there is some clearance for the fans. Not loads, but the three included units at the front, I think they are, yeah, 120 mils, as well as our two 120s at the top and 120 mil at the rear, should make for plenty of airflow to keep this thing cool. Temperatures and stuff we can dive into in a little bit more detail shortly. The final component to add into the build to get things powered up is the power supply. This is an NZXT 750 watt unit. 80 plus gold certified, fully modular, and comes with nearly all of the cables that we need. Let me explain. This isn't an ATX3 unit. This doesn't have the 12 pin compact power adapter we need for the GPU. And yes, I could use this dongle, but who wants to use a dongle, this big dongle, if they really don't have to? Not me. So instead, I've gone onto the internet and found this. This is a PCIe Gen 5 power cable to four eight pin GPU power cables. Now, an electrician somewhere is probably gonna tell me that this isn't really exactly how things are supposed to go, but we've tested it in lots of builds with some high wattage cards and never had a problem. So all we need to do is add this as an extension. I've also gone ahead and grabbed a motherboard power extension. This is a 24 pin sleeved unit from Easy DIY Fab. In fact, they're both from Easy DIY. YFAB, and it's going to make the build look that bit more special. I'm not going to add a power extension cable on for the CPU, as you can't really see that one anyway up in the left corner. Just the most visible ones are the ones I'll be opting to use. Once the PSU's in, we're basically done. So it's built, but of course the question probably on all of your minds before we take a look at how good it looks when it's all powered up is whether or not it will power up. So let's have a look. I'm going to short the front panel pins as I haven't yet plugged these in. Oh, okay, that's on. Fans aren't spinning though. Look to be a little bit of work before it actually is all perfectly functioning but the rgb is working the ram is lit up everything seems to be good to go a couple of fan headers and we should be ready to game so i'll see you in a few moments for the performance figures but first it's time for a montage <laughs> aesthetics in the bag, it's next time to check that this build provides the level of performance you'd expect from this budget. We've tested a wide variety of titles to make sure the numbers stack up, starting off with F1 2023 at 1440p. Here at the ultra high preset with ray tracing enabled first of all, the build achieved 95 FPS on average. 90 and 99th percentile results were good too, and as ever, all the frame rate data was tested with both NVIDIA's FrameView Tech and MSI Afterburner's Reaver Tuner. I thought though that the frame rate could go that little bit higher, but I didn't want to sacrifice resolution. So instead, I enabled DLSS3 with frame generation on the quality preset, and that supercharged the system to 138 FPS. DLSS3 is undoubtedly one of the largest advantages of an RTX 40 series GPU, and the 4070 is in quite a good sweet spot, really, to enable that technology. Hogwarts Legacy at 1440p high also worked well. 85 FPS on average, with 90 and 99th percentile results of 76 and 63. Move through into Warzone 2 and at 1440p high here, the build achieved just shy of 110 FPS on average. 109 to be precise, with 90 and 99th percentile results that look good as well. While moving through into games like Fortnite also delivered great results. 272 FPS at 1080p competitive settings, very consistent frame rates and enough to make sure you get that competitive upper hand. Apex Legends at 1440p high did WoW 2 176 FPS in this battle Battle Royale title. 90 and 99th percentiles look good, meaning you've got a pretty consistent frame rate in this game. Overwatch 2 at 1440p Ultra and the build delivered 249 FPS on average. Once again, another really, really good result with the build showing consistent frame rates throughout. Call of Duty's Modern Warfare 2 at 1440p also did well. Here we managed to get a lovely little kill with a great frame rate to match. 106 FPS on average to be precise. With a fantastic smooth gaming experience 
that's in all the titles we checked out. You can learn more about all the parts that make this build possible at the affiliate links down in the description below. Thanks for tuning in though, and as always, we'll see you in the next one.